everybody, and welcome to another episode of Three League OGs. As always, I'm your moderator, Ashley Stroline, joined by my three co-hosts, Muggsy Bogues, Earl Curitan, and Charles Oakley. Guys, how's it going this week? Good. Great. How are you doing? Good today. How's I'm doing good. good. I, I'm excited about our guest today, but before we get to that, we uh, got to do hot topics and memory lane. So we'll start with our hot topic of the day. Obviously, the NBA trade deadline just passed. Some moves were made. Who do you guys have as the winners and losers of that? Wow. I like I, I like the, the Lakers. I, I, I kind of assumed that Drummond would go to the Lakers. Uh, you know, the only concern was I was thinking they may not be able to pay him next year, but it looked like he chose to go there. I think he's going to be a good fit for that team. Uh, they need a shot blocker. We talked about that a little bit in, in the last episode, but he definitely need the shot blocking and the rebounding. And uh, right now with both of those guys being out, I mean, I'm sure they're going to want him to play right away because they're trying to win basketball games so they can qualify for the playoffs. So I think that was a huge pickup for them. Uh, they, they may be the winners of uh, the trade deadline if it, if it works out. Well, I think they got the best player available, but can he play with them, the Lakers? Uh, he's a guy been wanting the ball in the post like the White Howard's proud about for many years. But you get the ball in the post, you can't make your free throws. So he gonna, he gonna have to go from playing 30 some minutes down to about 24, 25. Is he ready to sacrifice? He ain't been on teams, never did sacrifice. But LeBron had changed a lot of guys over the years. So mm. yeah, they got the best player available. Can he sustain that with the Lakers and move forward and sell it for 20 minutes a night, sometimes 25? So they gonna play AD late game at the five, stretch the floor. And do different things. So we get leg of the edge right now. That's the see. Drama is the key. Yeah, um, I, I I would probably agree with that in terms of the Lakers pickup. Uh, I do like the Rondo trade going to uh, to the Clippers. Clippers. I think that's going to be a big uh, pickup for them. His leadership, what he brings to the to the table, his pedigree as well. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the Mark Aldridge and and Blake Griffin being added to. Um, the Brooklyn Nets. I mean, you see, Blake already has some games on his belt. Uh, it looked like he, you know, he had a good game. Went back to Detroit, fit in, um, and with KD come back, how well all of that will uh, gel uh, with that unit. You know, there's some name recognition, but still, you know, Harding and, and still playing lifestyle basketball. So I still get an edge to Brooklyn, just because, not because of the the addition with Aldridge and and uh, Blake, but more so with James Harden. Yeah, I think Drummond's probably grown up from the Detroit day. It was a lot of pressure on Drummond up here in Detroit. They wanted him to carry a team up here. Uh, I don't think he'll have to do that in L.A. I think he'll he'll accept the role, whatever it is down there. I mean, Detroit was uh, paid him a lot of money, expected for him. He wanted to score because that's what they thought he should be doing, and he was trying to please everybody. I think his best thing is rebounding and shot blocking. And I think that's going to be a, a good fit. I think he's matured enough now. He's in his eighth year in the league that he'll go down there and do what he's supposed to do to try to win a championship. So you think the decision was made based on as opposed to not going into a place like New York where you possibly could get paid going forward as opposed to just going to, to the lake and just uh, to try to chase for a ring right now? Well, I think he will. I mean, that would make his stock a little bit valuable. If he play, have a great playoff and they win a championship, it, he'll become a free agent at the end of the year. So he'll be attractive, even more attractive if, if all that happens for him. So I'm sure those same teams that, wanna, that wanted him now will want him even more then. Um, I think it's it gonna be an issue. I'm hoping it's not for LeBron's sake, because you know you go you expect a lot out of him, and you know the ball going through AD and LeBron when they come back. So well, he's gonna be so. I mean, what, what what would be the difference between him and Dwight Howard? I mean, Dwight Howard struggled at the free throw line, couldn't really score the post. I mean, they need a guy to plug Dwight that Howard, middle up. Dwight, mm -hmm. Dwight grew up. Dwight's a better athlete. Um. You know, they probably shoot free throw the same. They're like Shaq. Dwight, he got it. He understand. He it took him four or five teams. <laughs> but like four or five teams, just drum a second going third. So it might take him the LA win the championship, a bid war, New York will probably you know, I'll pay everybody. And then he gonna go back to his old self. Yeah. I don't think he can sustain it. Yeah, I, yeah, my, I was just thinking that he that decision that he made to go to LA. Uh, as opposed to going to somewhere like New York, who's up and coming, who possibly, you know, being out of there with them and possibly at the end of the season, uh, signing up and, and taking that big paycheck again. But, you know, it could happen again, even though if you go to L.A. and if they win and he does what he's supposed to do, 
that uh, that those teams would just come uh, after him. But I just, for me, I'm just thinking he would probably look at those. The decision he made was determined for me. He's, you know, he's going for the ring. Hmm, no doubt. Yep. All right, time to move on to our next segment. Memory Lane, this is one of my favorites because we get to hear the behind the scenes, never before told stories from you guys. Uh, Oak, we're going to start with you today because last week we had on Tracy McGrady. He definitely shared some nice stories that maybe some of us hadn't heard before. Uh, one that you guys kind of touched on and it's in my notes to ask you about would kind of be the incident that happened uh, on the way to Sacramento, and they want to know if you can share that on the podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, Tracy already and shared that story on uh, some someone else podcast. Basically, it was just we having a good time, had the day off. Uh, but you know, Butch is one of them coaches that you know he gonna work you, but he gonna let you have your fun. So that day we had fun. It might have got a, you know, I might have went a little far, but uh, you know, I apologize to the guy and. Tried to buy the guy a new suit, and uh, <laughs> the guy was a quiet guy, you know. But he was with us. But I'm saying, but he was always, you know, he shy away as we get off the bus, the plane. Story didn't make my top twenty five. <laughs> <laughs> didn't the crack fun. the top twenty five. Oh my goodness. No, 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 no. It was fun. There was nothing malicious or anything. It was just a fun atmosphere that we had. We was joining us up going to to Sacramento, and uh, and. Al, one of our teammates just had on his new newest suit, fresh suit, and just he had in the, you know, sitting back there, and he wasn't participating in the things that we was doing. So, you know, we just had opportunity. So, to Oak made him a participant. There. I didn't hear this yeah, story. I, I wonder how this story. You know, I don't hear a lot of stories, but I didn't hear this one. <laughs> well, he just added another color to the to the suit. You know, the color, the color, the, the suit is another it was color. Green and brown. <laughs> yeah. It was green at first, then it turned brown. Oh, yeah. Well, so did he partake in future, you know, hangout times on the way to games and that kind of stuff or on off days, or he just stayed far away? Nah, I mean, I mean, like, like guys, we didn't hold grudge against one another. <laughs> That's how we got along. We just fun <laughs> the day, whatever happened that day happened, and we get on to the next day. So I, I said it's just like a brother thing, you know. Sometimes a big brother had to show the brother something. Okay, so you were the big brother. <laughs> All right, let's go to memory lane for Earl. Um, our question here, what sticks out the most for you when you think back on uh, the first NBA championship you won in Philly uh, with the 76ers? How was it different from your one in Houston? Uh, well, the Philly team, you know, I went three years there in a row, uh, you know, and going there twice, uh, Eastern Conference Finals going to game seven. Uh, it was, it was, you know, it was perseverance. Uh, <laughs> You know, it was great for Doc. You know, uh, you know he's chasing that ring in the NBA. Mm -hmm. You know, he had his ABA rings, but I think everybody in the world at that particular time probably wanted to see Julius win a championship, and uh, so did I. You know, uh, you know, being uh, idolizing him and watching him growing up and having an opportunity to partake and be a part of winning a championship. I mean, it was like the most wonderful feeling in the world uh, when we swept the Lakers down there. I mean, uh, me and Andrew Tony and uh, we celebrated, and that team was a real close knit team and. Still, is to this day, we all stay in contact with each other and talk to each other all the time. And it, it was a great year. You know, you go 67 and 17 and sweep all the way through the playoffs and uh, finally reach that ultimate goal of winning the NBA championship. Uh, it was an incredible feeling uh, to be able to do that. And the people in Philly, you know, they still remember all that to this day because they haven't won one since. And we have a memory lane for Muggsy, but we're going to circle back to that because our guest is here. And you just mentioned it, Earl. You won the championship with him. Mm -hmm. Julius Irving is going to be joining us. So we're going to give him just a minute to hop in. And here he is. Hey, man, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. Good, good to be with you guys. Well, I know these guys have a, a lot of stuff to cover with you. So I'll let them get us started here with some questions while we have you on three league OGs. Okay. Yeah, first, Doc, I see. I truly want to say thank you for joining our, our podcast. I know you're a busy man and you have many things that you can be doing. But my very first question is that because I got this video from Earl Curtin and I've been having it. I mean, he sent it to me, thing like every year. <laughs> uh, so he had a sky hook. He sent me a video. He said a sky hook of a Kareem doing, a, I guess, doing a championship <laughs> run, you guys, play, just to let me know that he was definitely. A contributor to that team. So, can you speak on that for me about for my man Earl Curtis? Well, 
uh, Muggsy, uh, good to be with you again, man. You know, I think the last time we saw each other, we were in a gym. And there's a lot of players from China over at the Sixers Center in Camden. And they kept talking about playing Villanova. <laughs> and I was like, y'all don't want no parts of Villanova. <laughs> no, they didn't. Those guys, they don't want no parts of that. But, uh, you know, speaking of Camden and speaking of Philly, uh, you know, Earl and I were, were teammates there. Uh, you know, we shared the championship experience. Uh, the team was kind of odd. We had four forwards, four guards, and four centers. And and Earl kind of played center and forward, so, he, you know, he could mix it up a little bit. Uh, he did have a running hook shot. <laughs> I, I, saw, I saw it go in a number of times, you know. <laughs> so and, I miss a little bit. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I mean, you know, first of all, you know, Earl's strong suit, was the fact that his uh, desire and his uh, physical ability, you know, he could run like a deer. I mean, if he, if ain't no catching him, if he gets out in front of you, and, and this was on the track as well as on the basketball court and a very, very high uh, basketball IQ. He, he, he played uh, the game mentally, you know, and he, he played it out before he played it on the court. So any, so he was always ready. He was always ready, man. You got four centers, and you know you, you, you yeah. you're like, all right, man. I want to get in this rotation somehow. <laughs> and be ready was the way, because you know Big Mo was was holding it down, and Clement was backing him up. And um, you know, I think we had Mark McNamara, and then uh, and Earl, and uh, and he just he just stayed ready, man. And his personality. Uh, bubbly, uh, alive, you know, I mean, you even think of guys coming out of Detroit, you know, you think gangster and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> but Earl, Earl was cool, man. Earl yeah. was cool and funny, you know, he always had a, 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 a joke for you. And yes. he, and Andrew, he and Andrew Tony, man, they bonded real quick. And they're like, we in this thing together, you know, so that's the way it was. Yeah, yeah, Doc, I tried to explain to these guys it was a different league back then. You know, with 11th man roster when we came in, uh, you know, rookies didn't see a whole lot of playing time. You know, Philadelphia yeah. being the, if not the, the best team in the league when I got there, it was a whole different world, you know, just, but yeah, everybody knew their role on our team and accepted it, uh, whatever it was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. being there. And me, I was, you know, really excited just to have opportunity to be on the same team with you, you know, growing up idolizing you and watching you. Uh, you know, in college and all, oh, and in that oh. locker room, be around <laughs> the doctor. You know that, that that was an incredible thing. My first year, I remember just sitting there, just watching. You know, just seeing. You know, but you didn't disappoint me though. You know, you uh, yeah. taught me a lot of things, and uh, you know, that stuck with me and helped me. You know, throughout the rest of my life. So it, it was yeah. great. You know, it was a great great yeah. situation. Even now, man. Even now, you know, we uh, you know, when I came out to do that uh, thing over at Meadowbrook, mm -hmm. you know, you were the guy I called. No doubt. Come on out, come on out and hang with me. And I get out there, and, and um, uh, uh, Vinny's out there, right? And uh, Je, uh, the other Je Edwards, yeah, yeah he, he's out there. They just hanging out, mm -hmm. and uh, and we just hung out for the day, you know, and signed some autographs for the customers and, and did the thing. But you know, I, I like to stay connected at the hip and have you know personal references uh of experiences and charles and i have had you know uh, the same type of experiences hanging out with a uh, jason williams over there at hilton head <laughs> we go out on jason's boat and charles is there cooking food for everybody and we got we got back we got it back from the boat after uh, a few incidents happened with the boat of course <laughs> but we got back man charles charles had uh, fix us a meal second to none. It was just like, oh man, we don't need no wives. We got Charles around the way. He's <laughs> I know mean, that's awesome. I know Doc. I mean, since the time, I mean, you've been playing this game of basketball for quite some time, and seeing, I mean, from the time that you came in in 1972, all the players that you've seen and skill set, um, and watching these guys today. I mean, we we always say now. It's no positions. You know, we had positions back then with a one, the two, the three, the four, and the five. Uh, today, mm -hmm. you're looking at seven footers now, bring the basketball up, uh, uh, starting the offense. What do you think 
of today's athletes as opposed to back then when you guys when we put when you play or when we play yeah first thing i think about is uh the challenge for the coaches uh if a guy is a older traditional minded coach he almost can't coach these guys mm -hmm. so, He's going to constantly be yelling at him, man, get the ball to the guard. I mean, I can see Billy Cunningham right now coaching the team. <laughs> yeah, we, got the team out there. We, didn't, we didn't find Maurice Cheeks or whatever. That was grounds to come out of the game because <laughs> cause he needed to bring it up and he needed to set the offense and he needed to, you know, be the attack man and whatever, unless you, you know, grab the long rebound and you had a head start on the field or unless you stole the ball and you had a head start on the field and you could take it all away, take it coast to coast, which I like to do. Uh, but before it was, hey, make the outlet pass. And now the outlet pass is all but gone. I mean, that's, I'm sure they don't even teach that when, when they're teaching in elementary or, you mm -hmm. know, CIO or, or whatever, where they're saying, make an outlet pass and go out and fill the lanes or whatever. Plus the dudes are filling the lanes, they run into the corners. <laughs> you know, they, they run into put the three ball up so they run into the line and not run into the paint so uh if you're a coach yeah you've had to totally adjust your style just like we have had to adjust our styles visually and you know figuring out is this good or it's not good because you know the league has always been a copycat league mm -hmm. team that plays a certain way, they win the title. Hey, the half the teams in the league are going to try to play that way next year if they didn't the previous year. So so that continues. And, you know, you look at the success of the Warriors, uh, you know, you look at LeBron's teams and how they play, you know, I mean, you got a six, eight point guard <laughs> or whatever. So uh, nobody else has that matchup. But they try, you know, and they try to copycat, you know, by – Playing the same, trying to play the same way as the team that has the most success or the teams that have the most success. Hey, Doug. Yeah, we, Oak, we, Oak, Oak here. Oh, you know, okay, man. We we've been around and cigars. Yeah, man, I just Jason, saw your drugstore. <laughs> Jay, I just saw your drugstore. I just yeah, saw you in the uh, drugstore two weeks Doc, ago. Yeah. No, Doc, playing with Moses, experience like that, a guy working hard like that. Never been yeah. another guy like that. Shaq just big and whatever. But Mo can run the floor. He can step away and shoot the jumper. He gonna give you twenty and twenty. Man, that's a luxury. Have like, like you drive one of your Bentleys every day. It's luxury. <laughs> you had to feel great to be playing with Moses. I know you know you was you know both yeah. y'all star, but have a guy can do all of that every night. Yeah. yeah. Play, you yeah. know, he, his own shot and get the rebound, put it up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, know, I, I, when I was at Union, he came to the campus one day. Whoa, 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 you know, so <laughs> and I never forget that, you know, Moses coming up to Petersburg, come down to Union, and, you know, it gave me confidence, you know, so to see a guy like yeah. that asking me, well, okay, and, you know, I was having 2020, so I guess <laughs> you probably need that. Well, to see that guy, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so give me some, give me some insight on Mo. I know a lot okay. of people. Okay, so if y'all want to, you know, go into the archives, I, I'm, I'm one of the 2020 guys too, you know, yeah. <laughs> from college, <laughs> from college, well, from college basketball. Right? Yeah, so it was what it was, but um, you know, just with Moses, um, and Moses was right in the beginning when he came out of high school, and, mm -hmm. and he went to uh, he went to Utah. So I was playing with the Nets then. That was like 1974. And, um, you know, we had, we definitely had the best team in the league. He came in and they asked me to welcome him to the league. You know, so I, you know, I grabbed a microphone and I said, you know, something uh, associated with, you know, if you, if you dive into the deep water, you gotta be able to swim. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and and so college ball would be like going to a lake compared to going to pro ball from high school, and he was going to pro ball from high school, high and, school. and it was an ABA experience. And you know, we always, you know, considered ourselves equal. We just didn't get the publicity, and we didn't, you know, make the same money. 
And, you know, there were, there were differences in the league, you know, because of hype, I think, as much as anything else. Because uh, after that first year, you know, 11 of the 24 All-Stars were former ABA players. So, so Big Mo introducing them to the league in 74, and then in 82, you know, eight years later, uh, becoming uh, teammates, that was super special because I had been the MVP of the league in, in 81 and, uh, and he was to go on and become a two or three time MVP of the league. Uh, so, so that combination, that combination for me, um, especially after in six years, the six previous seasons, you know, going to the finals three times in six years and coming in second, you know, I mean, that was, I had, you know, the success in the ABA with championships and MVPs in the playoffs, but that was hurting, man. That was hurting. I was like, what we got to do to get over this hump? And I went to China that summer after, you know, after we lost to uh, LA. And while I was in China, Pat Williams gets the call from Harold Katz. And I'm sitting with ML Carr. And this, this was, a, a, you know, we were like a delegation going over to China, right? And, and so Pat Williams tells me and ML Carr at the same time, <laughs> the Sixers just got Moses Malone. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. And you ever see a black guy turn white? <laughs> <laughs> ML, so ML said, oops, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I said, hey, man, it's good news to my ears, boy. It's good news to my ears. Then when we were at the training camp, you know, Cheeks was Cheeks was just like, man, I think we can win every night. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can win every night. This boy, he was he was working more. He was working harder than James Brown. Yeah. <laughs> and you know James Brown was the hardest making working man in show business. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I told I told Muggs we had a conversation and I said you know the chemistry is was everything uh because you know Moses was you know as big a great a player as he was the personality was just totally normal I mean he came yeah. in and set the stage right away he let everybody know I'm I'm joining Dr. J this is his yeah. team I'm coming in here to help yeah. win a championship and that was established yeah. from day one uh it wasn't yeah. no more conversation about it nothing being said about it and that was his role and that's how and that's how he played it. everybody you know, fit a role and played their role in Philadelphia. And that was what was so great about our basketball team. I think that's why we feel so close to this day. Uh, you know, we all yeah. still communicate with each other, but everybody knew exactly who they were and what they were on that team. And that's what made it yeah. so great. Yeah, and that playoff run, 12 and one, or whatever, that, that set the bar real high. Oh, you know? yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you, can't, you can't do that no more because you don't, you don't get a bye in that first round. And uh, you have the best record, you know, but then we used to get a bye. So we'd start into the second round and play second, third and fourth rounds. So, yeah, that was that was that was super special, man. And then, oh, you know, compliments to you. You played that type of game, too. I mean, you know, you're not no. big, big as Moses. Uh, you didn't have a scoring capability or whatever, but you brought that to the table, you know, night in and night out. You know, that's why. You were such a desired commodity in, in basketball. It would have been a real pleasure uh, to play with you because, you know, beyond the enforcer's role or whatever, your IQ as a basketball player, man, was right on time and right on tap. I and, appreciate uh, up, that. Up there, up there with the best of them, mm -hmm. or whatever. And it gave you the years that you got in the league and, and still the reverence, you know, that you have, you know, now that you're not even playing anymore out here making commercials. <laughs> and and dancing dance with the stars, yeah, don't leave that out. Yeah, I hear you. So, yeah, I appreciate all that, you know, good talking about me. But uh, I got, since you were talking about Enforcer, I got this book coming in about five months. It's going to be a, okay. this book going to have, so it ain't a lot of basketball, it's just a lot of like real stuff in life, incident, yeah. someone. Like someone engage with me, give me a chance to talk about them, and it's yeah. it's, it's, it's gonna be some. It's gonna be something to see. That's that's gonna be good, man. That's gonna be well received. Oh yeah, because you know you got 
you got you got a, you got a, an audience, man. That whatever it is, mm-hmm. magic, yeah. mystical, or whatever. But you got people who uh, you know who who love uh, your your fact that you so candid and you straightforward and you honest. You know, and I know when them shoes come off, it's gonna be a battle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, well, right. Doc, I want to ask you this, man. I know you you won probably forty seven different awards throughout your sixteen year career. You know, everybody, you know, ambassador uh, for the league. I mean, just a class act throughout. You carried the NBA. Uh, you know, all the stuff you did in the ABA. You know, two championships, and then coming to the NBA and carrying the, uh, the NBA up until Magic and Bird stepped into, you know, in place and kept keeping everything together. How do you sit back and reflect on all, all these things that, that happened to you right now? A lot of people can reflect on their career, but you've done so much over those 16 years on and off the basketball court. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so, you know, that, that run from 71 to 87, when you look at it now, man, 87, what was that, 30 something years ago, <laughs> 34 years ago. So I've been out a, a lot longer than I was in. And, uh, you know, it's nice to have that as an athletic uh, foundation for the part of my life that deals with athletics and deals with recreation. But for me, you know, I mean, I deal with, I deal with business, I deal with education, you know, I deal with social issues. I deal with relationships, family relationships, extended family relationships. And, you know, a lot of the other things that <clears throat> I deal with and you have to deal with as a person have nothing to do with athletics. But it's nice to have that as a, as a door opener or a door closer, you know, when things come down the pike. And, and, and for me, you know, that whole uh, resume associated with my my athletic career you know it's 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 carved in stone because i know that you know people like you earl and uh and many others uh quinn buckner comes to mind and michael jordan comes to mind a lot of people come to mind magic johnson they come to mind in terms of you know giving me that phone call and asking for advice or asking for an opinion or asking for well you know I, i've looked at your path and that might be a good path for me. And in some cases, it allows people to go farther than I've gone. And in other cases, it just gives them a chance to be lifted up and be a better man and be a better citizen and be a better, better, better player, and be a better, you know, just be better, find a way for them to be a better them. So, so I like that and I understand that. And you, you asked me how it makes me feel. I mean, I feel very comfortable in my skin and I feel as though that I'm a good person and I've been able to help a lot more people than people have been able to help me. Uh, but that's, you know, that's part of what the gift is. I mean, if you've been gifted, you know, if God has gifted you with ability, then he, he gifts you with responsibility. And some people can look at that as a gift and a challenge and a positive, or they could look at it as a curse. But I look at it as a, as a blessing, man, uh, and I will always look at it that way. And you know what's really important to just, just wrap this little piece up that we're talking right now? I, I honestly feel when I wake up in the morning that I'm going to have the best day of my life. I like to keep the carrot out in front of me. So when I, when I sit and I listen to somebody who's like 35, and I'm 71, right? When I listen to somebody 35, they're like, oh, man, you know, Best time of my life was when I was in high school, when I was in junior high, middle high, middle school, or whatever. And I'm like, dude, for real? <laughs> you need to keep you need to keep that out in front of you. You know, no, I mean, we had great times, experienced tremendous highs, and some lows. Uh, and and that, you know, those those are just part of part of life. But I would love for the best day of my life to be tomorrow, not yesterday. <laughs> no doubt. Mm-hmm. No doubt. Hey, and, uh, I, I want to hit you with something that that people don't know. I I, I did some deep, deep, deep digging, and uh, okay, okay. Want to talk about okay. First of all, you talked about your college career. Now we know you averaged twenty twenty or more than that when you you had the yeah. one game against Syracuse, where you had thirty eight and thirty two rebounds on your birthday. 
Yeah, yeah, it was 35. Man. 35. 35. <laughs> 30, 30, 30, 30. It was 32 points and 35 rebounds. 35 rebounds. Okay, well, I got I had it twisted there. They yeah. had a 6'10 guy, too, man. I was mm -hmm. like, I kept looking at it, man. I kept looking up at him. I was like, you know I'm going to get this ball, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, now, 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 what about the Chevy that you drove when you was in, in college? Every time you turn oh. right, the horn blow. <laughs> or you go up with some real insides. Yeah, I, got, I, I, I got some real stuff here now. <laughs> my, my, my father's brother, uh, Alfonso Irving, and my father's name was Julius. And my Alfonso Irving, man, he put the car. He put this car together for me once he knew I got had a college scholarship. And I don't know where he got all the parts from, but it was like a '61 Chevy Impala. <laughs> And I was, you know, this is 19, 1968. So, you know, it wasn't all that old, but, <laughs> right. but it was old. Yeah. It was old, man. And, and uh, when I made right turns, the horn would blow. So, <laughs> so everybody everybody thought I was born at them, right? <laughs> I the right so they wave and I wave. When I was on campus, man, I became very popular because of that car. <laughs> well, they, they, they also told me they knew it was all over the year you was getting ready to leave when you pull up in that black Mark IV. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was that was that was after my junior year. And, uh, you know, the Squires gave me like ten thousand dollar advance <laughs> advance on my salary. I didn't get a bonus. They gave me a, a ten thousand dollar advance, man. I ran out, put two thousand down on a, a, a blue on blue in blue mark three oh, now, let me tell you the story about the mark three yeah. all right because okay. I, I i loved lincoln's more so than cadillacs i was more <laughs> like a lincoln guy oh, yeah. but before that i go down with two of my friends from college herman curtis and alonzo somerville right and we go down to the to the uh the motor vehicle uh dealership and the state they have multiple cars so i'm looking at something like a Camry or Ford or, you know, just something, something reasonable. And we test, we test drive a few cars, every car that we test drove. Oh man, ain't enough room back here. Ain't, ain't enough headroom in here for you. And so, and so, so they kept upselling me, upselling me on the cars until I got to that Mark III. Mm. <laughs> everybody was happy once I got to the Mark III. <laughs> and I said, I said, you know what? I ain't never taking friends to buy no car no more. <laughs> I'm gonna get what I'm gonna end up getting what they want, not what I want. <laughs> you know, I talked to Tom McLaughlin. That was your your teammate in college. Yeah, so he, he gave me. Yeah, he told Tom me about the cage. He, he said playing in the cage. He said ask him about the cage. He said lined up at twelve o'clock to get in the cage. He said, <laughs> oh man, yeah, the Curry Hicks cage. <laughs> and uh, I've been in touch with him on social media stuff. Um, recently and we had we had a big uh UMass uh reunion of players Marcus Camby was on amongst others uh during uh homecoming time right back in October so you know it's, it's it's just like a testimony to to the college experience that many so many guys would go from high school to the pros you know they never have that unless right. they just do it virtually or do it online and those relationships that you have in high school and you have in college, man, they're very, very important in terms of your your happiness in life. Because if you can reflect on, you know, good good experiences and stuff like that, I mean, that's that's pretty healthy. But uh, yeah, the cage, the cage was a monster, man. We, you know, we put up, uh, we were eighteen and six my sophomore year, and then we were twenty three and two my junior year. Got snubbed by the NCAA you know, mm. both years. And went to, the NIT, went to the NIT and got whooped, you know, because we were 16 seed playing the first seed both years. So Marquette beat us when they were one, and then North Carolina beat us when they were when they were one. And George Carlin never let me forget about that game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only game I fouled out of my whole college career, man. I think we lost by almost like 40 points. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Crazy.
Well, Dr. J, a story that I shared with the guys on one of our previous podcasts, uh, if I had been a boy, my name was going to be Julius and I was going to be named after you because my dad said there was nothing better than Dr. J. He got a girl. We didn't go with Julia. We went with Ashley instead. Mom got named right. So, but just to wow. kind of know that, that the fans were so inspired and impacted by what you did on the court as well as off the court that some people probably did get their boy and they named him Julius, you know, that they just cared so much about what you did uh, yeah. on the court. You know, what does that mean to you? And what's the fan experience been like for you and how they well, felt you? That's a good, that's a very good question. And uh, I probably run into more people with cats and dogs named Doc and named Julius <laughs> than kids, <laughs> but there's a fair amount out there. And, uh, and it's, and it's interesting. I mean, you know, there's uh there's players in the league now like Julius Randle is in the league, and uh, there was a guy named Julius Keys who I played against. He played for the Denver Nuggets uh, back in the day, and there's stocks all over the place. Everybody wants to you know <laughs> carry uh, carry the nickname. Uh, so I I think how can you not feel bad about that? You know it's it's um you know I I carry my father's name. And, you know, Julius in terms of, you know, Roman history or whatever, the Julius Caesars of the world, whatever we were always thought to be, you know, leaders, conquerors and, and winners. So it's, 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 a, it's an interesting uh, Monica to have uh, associated with you and to have it replicated. And almost done in your situation, you know. But <laughs> but, but Ashley, Ashley fits you. Ashley okay, fits you. mom yeah. did all right with the name. Yeah, you doing all right. You doing all right with Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doc, I want I want to ask you this: is that um, you know, nineteen seventy? I know, you know, we had the opportunity. You know, while I was playing, mm -hmm. to be a part of a, a movie called Space Jam. You know, mm -hmm. so your friend. Yeah. You know, and 1979, I'll never forget it. This was, you know, I was just about 13, about to turn 14, and uh -huh. this movie came out, and uh, one of the characters in the movie, The Fish to Save Pittsburgh, people don't realize the little character name was Tyrone, and that's my name. My <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Was, that was my boy. He, yeah, he yeah. was a manager. So I was so excited when I had to, when I went to the Hippodrome to watch that movie, and to watch The Fish to Save Pittsburgh, and when I was watching, I was seeing all the you know, all these NBA players in there. I saw Kareem in there playing and you guys mm -hmm. was playing, but then I didn't see him anymore when you guys went to the, when y'all get to play him. So I always was wondering, whatever happened to Kareem in that movie? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting story because uh, Kareem was in it and John Shumate and, and, you know, a lot of guys who were the, the players of the day and Norman Nixon, of course. Um, so we, we had a scene and the, um, the director, this guy named uh, Gilbert, uh, Mo Moses Gilbert. And that's why they called me Moses in the movie because that was, that was his actual name. <laughs> and he was a director and he's no longer with us. He did, he did a few movies, um, but he and Kareem, Kareem didn't, didn't like to be told what to do. You know, <laughs> so the director had a way of telling instead of asking. And one day he told Kareem what to do and he caught him on a bad day. So he, <laughs> so, he so he lifted up a chair and he threw it. And that was his last day. He, went, <laughs> he, he, wasn't, he wasn't in the movie no more. He pulled a, he pulled, he pulled a chair, a chair throwing uh, fit. And everybody was like, whoa, you know, <laughs> he, throwing, he throwing the chair, man. <laughs> and, and they asked him to leave. And then suddenly in the championship game, he wasn't there for the championship game. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it was real conspicuous, man. You got a good eye. Because <laughs> they never, because they never explained what, what happened. Mm -hmm. Never explained what happened, but they had to shoot the championship uh, game, you know, the Pisces against the second team. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and it was funny and it was, you know, it was kind of very conspicuous to us. 
but you you like the first person to ask me that question. Man. <laughs> oh, what man, happened to him? That was what happened movie. to him. That was my <laughs> movie. I mean, we was, I mean, bullet, 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 but I mean, set shot. Yeah. <laughs> that was something yeah. we really just. And the no, music in there was awesome, man. The sound yeah. of Philadelphia. And, 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 you know, the, yeah, yeah the, Debbie Allen in that movie. Debbie Allen was the cheerleader in that movie. Debbie right? Allen, yeah. yeah. That's that's when she and Norman met, man. Mm -hmm. They met on they met on the set, you yeah. know. <laughs> All these years later, yeah. yeah. Well, Fish that say Pittsburgh. Just to say, just to switch up to a uh, more of a serious note, you know, I, I don't know during um, during your time when you was playing, would it ever been a social issue that was out in front that the players kind of took as a you know as an initiative that they, they want to get part during the uh, time of their career, like the guys, and, and also another part of that. What do you think about LeBron and them and the guys today? Yeah. In terms they're using the platform to speak out on yeah. this, this uh, a, a lot of pride a lot of a lot of personal pride uh just in terms of you know being a role model and inspiration to to a lot of guys who now have a voice and who are using their voices and whatever in the past i think you know part of our role uh was to you know try to be leaders and also uh help to identify the leaders of the day. So the Martin Luther Kings of the day, the Malcolm X's of the day, you know, when you talk about the uh, 60s and, and the 70s, uh, that was a tumultuous time. I mean, I was in 1963 when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. You know, I was 13 years old. And, uh, you know, it just broke my heart that somebody who, my mom had his picture up on the wall. We always had Kennedy and King on the wall as being, you know, the, the people who were there for, for black people and, uh, and for minorities. They, 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 they were clear in terms of their stance and they were, they were our leaders and we, would, we needed to follow them. And you had to in the 60s, you had to follow somebody, you know? So, you know, if you were going to follow the Black Panthers then follow the Black Panthers and be true to the message and be true to the mission, if you were going to follow Dr. King, then follow Dr. King. And if you were just going to be a good Christian or, or whatever, I mean, you had to, you couldn't sit on the fence or whatever. So, so I, I always felt that Dr. King was the right way. And, you know, since I grew up in a Baptist church and, you know, when he was taken away from us in, in April of, well, the anniversary is coming up, I think April 4th, uh, in 1968, when he was taken away from us, man, you know, there was riots and there was uh, madness uh, associated with the loss. And um, and it's reflected. I just watched a, a movie on uh, uh, James Brown called Get On Up last night mm -hmm. on, on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And they got to the point in the movie where Dr. King got assassinated and how it affected him because he he, uh, he had to go to a concert the next day in Boston it was going to be 10,000 people there. So was this going to turn, was this concert going to be canceled? They tried to cancel it. And then he said, no, let's, let me get with my people and let me talk to them and let me, let me influence them. So they're not going to hit the streets and riot. And, and it might happen in other places all across the country, but it's not going to happen here. So that was, that was a good voice uh, to be heard. And, and whether you're an athlete or whether you're an entertainer or whatever, I think, you know, you're a role model. You're a more role model to somebody. It might just be your little brother, you know, or your little sister, or your cousin, or, or Dookie down the street, or whatever, you know. So, so, um, so for me, you know, I've always kind of accepted a certain a certain role, and it was guided by, you know, not wanting to disappoint my family first, you know, especially my mom because she had a you know, she had to raise us, you know, by herself after my father had left and then eventually died. And so she had to raise three kids by herself. I said, I'm not going to be a problem here. I'm not going to be a burden to her. You know, I mean, I want to be an example uh, to her and, and to others. And when I look at uh, the efforts of, of the guys today, when I started in the ABA, yeah, we had a, we had a lockout. We had a, we had a time when we were not going to play in the all-star game because of the shares and just took a stance and, you know, it probably got, was unnoticed because we didn't have the same type of TV coverage as the NBA. 
but every year there was some type of uh, experience that uh, parallels the experiences of the day, uh, but there's more of a global spotlight on the experiences today because as soon as something is done, I mean, it gets on that internet and people all over the world know what's being said and know who's saying it. And that just, there's a certain other, uh, a certain amount of pressure associated with that to be right and to be on the right side of, of uh, discussions and the right side of decisions and whatever. So I don't, I don't fault somebody who, you know, takes a back seat because they don't want to be on the wrong side. And, uh, and I applaud the guys who are like LeBron who are on the right side and Chris Paul and, and, and the many others. And those guys are from Milwaukee, you know, who, who stood up and said, man, you know, you know, George, George Floyd <clears throat> got killed. I don't feel like playing basketball today. I don't feel like playing basketball tomorrow when I don't know when I'm going to play again, unless something is something that is done about this. So, uh, yeah, I do, I do applaud him today and I watch it, you know, I've been watching the trial uh of uh you know uh Derek Schaffen. and uh you know it's I mean it, in my opinion in my mind you know the guy was uh, clearly murdered and he was murdered by somebody with a badge and a gun uh so does that make a different murder's murder you know that's true them, but... that's true yeah, yeah. I, I, I really so, appreciate your take on that um, yeah you know, a lot of us, I mean, they always say, well, you know, back then only certain people stood up and and, it, and it's to each and own, you know, if you want to be out in the forefront of it, then that's your right to say so. I mean, you're right to do so. If you want to be behind the scenes, it's your right as well. So I credit those guys who are just out there, you know, trying to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. We're all trying to make a difference, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you, you always had the ability to buy <laughs> being yourself. I mean, so many people looked up to you and respect you. You listen to the comments of uh, all the players, you know, from George Gervin and Magic and all these guys, uh, all of them pretty much say the same thing about you, the way you carried yourself. And, uh, you know, George Gervin made a comment. He said he used to watch you himself and pick up a lot of things from you. So he knew how to handle himself. He said he mm -hmm. learned a lot about, so your professionalism really helped a lot of players throughout this league. Uh, just your presence, just being around you, uh, guys pick that up and you kind of set a tone for what a professional athlete should be like. Uh, yeah. you know, the way you articulate yourself, the way you dress, uh, the way you play the game. Uh, it, it just set a presence for a lot of players in the league. Yeah. You know, so your, your, you know, your leadership and, you know, not have to say anything, but mm -hmm. you showed it, you know, on and off the basketball court. That, that's what I always saw in you. Yeah, that's what you say and what you do. Right, because <laughs> right. yeah, a lot of people could be saying something and doing the total opposite. Yeah, whatever. But what you do, I mean, you know, you go if you judge by what you do, then that's pretty strong, and uh, and find a way to be consistent, you know, with what you do. So it's not about the peaks and the valleys or whatever. It's about you know being consistent across the board. So who you are, who you are, man. You know, if you're a knucklehead, be a knucklehead every day. You're gonna have a lot of friends because they're gonna say, well. You know, the guy's a knucklehead, but he's my knucklehead because, you know, because <laughs> I hang with him and it, and it is what it is. And I, I'm thinking you got a lot of that from your mom, from what I've all I looked yeah. at and seen. Uh, you know, I saw your Hall of Fame speech and I know you did that a day after Mother's Day. Uh, yeah. You, you, you shout out to her. And I think uh, yeah. I think she probably set that tone for you. Yeah. Yeah, she did. She uh, right right from Jump Street. And, you know, she. She played a little ball when she was like in high school. You know, I saw I saw a picture of uh, her team at Bettis Academy in Baseburg, South Carolina, and she was holding the ball. And I said, "Oh, you must have been the captain or something, because they let you hold the ball." <laughs> then I saw a picture of us, Earl, and you were holding the ball. <laughs> yeah, I got that. I got that picture on the wall here. <laughs> yeah, you got the ball, man. How did Earl get the ball? He must have just grabbed it from somebody. <laughs> well, you you got Jewel playing up at Berkeley now. How's Jewel doing? Yeah, he he let basketball go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is his senior year. He's graduating next month, so he played played two two and a half years there, and then he just decided, you know, he wasn't getting wasn't getting minutes and. Mm -hmm. You know, this wasn't the most important thing in his life, and he and he was better, was a good student. So, you know, I said, "Well, go on and get that, you know, 
get that 4.0 or 5.0, whatever it is in college these days. And, you know, you'll you make your mark in life and you can always come back to basketball in some capacity right. or whatever. But, you know, everybody's route is different, you know, and I, right. I look at my route and different people's routes and everybody doesn't have to take the same route. So he's he can really graduate. Thanks for asking about him because right. I know your daughter's graduating too, right? You know, right. I know you're proud of him. Yeah, I've been, I've been yeah. trying to get them trying to get them to meet, you know. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we ought to we ought to do Girl, that. Girl, you already in the family. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know he's super smart. You know, my daughter took the same route. She walked on and you know got the grades, yeah. graduating out of Georgetown this year and you know yeah. right at a four point yeah. oh same. Yeah, that's cool, man. That is that is so cool. That is so cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we have a we have a six hey, reunion, y'all. and we bring them. Oh, yeah. be like a little setup. We have have a little six or eighty eighty three six. We reunion. got one coming up. It's gonna be we we creeping up on that forty year period right now. It should yeah, be about a year, man. You know? Forty yeah. years. Forty years. Yeah. We still we still holding it down. We holding it hey, down. Keep You're breathing. Out. Y'all still look good. I can yeah. that. Hey, thank you. <laughs> I don't know about when you walk, Earl. Earl, you walk. Your walk kill you though. Oh man, you don't need. Somebody say, "Hey, Mister Water, Earl." Oh man, you gotta go. <laughs> 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 Earl, 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 hey man, hey man, I gotta, I gotta, I'm gonna let you guys go, man. I right. appreciate, so appreciate you. you taking Thanks, the time. All the all right. All right. I'll Thank see you me. back down there with the snakes. What? You know it. You know it. All right, take care, man. I'll Bye. be in touch. All right, so a lot of great conversation there with Dr. J. Great stories from you guys as well. Some insight. Earl doing his homework. Taking Earl did all his homework. Earl, right? Yeah, I, I, I thought I was the studious one of the group. Earl's out doing me here. That's, that's, that's my <laughs> idol there. Come C2 on, now. Good job. You know, I, I idolized Dr. J. I had, I had yeah. Dr. J posters hanging up in the room in college and Man, I never thought I would have an opportunity to be on the same team with that guy. You know, I had two big Dr. J posters hanging up and, you know, I just followed him, watched the first dunk contest they had when he was in the ABA with David Thompson and Larry Keenan. And, you know, those guys, I saw that, I happened to catch that in a hotel room when I was my first year in college. And, uh, you know, and that was the ABA back then. And, and they had, you know, uh, artist Gilmore and Keenan and Doc and, you know, all those guys. And he, and he won that dunk contest and the All-Star game was just off the hook. I mean, the ABA, brought so much flavor. The NBA didn't have that type of flavor that the ABA had. They had some guys in there that was just straight pure entertainment in there. And I, know, uh, they I was left, gonna ask you about that kind of Hawkins. They were able to do a lot of a lot of things they couldn't do in the NBA. I was gonna ask you, I heard him and County Hawkins had like a pawning contest. Oh yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and that shit went on for about 15, 20 minutes and he finally, <laughs> he finally drilled it out of the, out of his hand. Uh, I'm like, well, dang, how big Phil's hands were. Mm. We'll have to have him back for part two. We'll go through all the other questions that we, we didn't get to today. Oh, Earl, Earl will be ready. <laughs> Six shoot Earl. <laughs> the car, turn the car with the horn. Oh, God damn, where you get that one from? Man. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, they say every time he turned the corner, turn right, the horn go off. So <laughs> my man said he every time he leave his, leave the house, he had to get the jumper cables. If Doc was driving, he said he got the jumper cables. He knew his ride was going to stop. <laughs> well, I want to circle back just because when he hopped on, we didn't uh, finish memory lane. And of course, we had one for Muggsy that we didn't get to. Um, the one that we have for your memory lane, when you kind of think back, what's the most memorable halftime speech that was given to you and your team by a coach? Is there one that comes to mind? I don't, we don't get to hear those things, but okay. <laughs> And only one stands out. I only had one coach that ever did this to, to me and probably to the entire team. And may rest in peace because Dick Hart was a good man. He was a good guy. Uh, but, you know, it was doing now first year with the Hornets. It was an expansion draft that took place. Uh, we believe we was playing the Lakers. The Lakers was having, our, have, having their way with us. They probably was up by like 20 or 22 at halftime. And he was just furious. He just came in the locker room with every player sitting in their seat. He decided to go around the horn. I mean, <laughs> he took every player and talk about everything, what the deficiency of uh, whatever they think their strength was. It didn't mean crap in the league that they was doing. He went, he stopped Muggsy. The sis don't mean shit in this league, son. You got to pay the score in order to compete in this league. Dale Curry, 
in order for you to help us, you got to give us 30 because your dead man is going to give us 40. <laughs> <laughs> he went down. <laughs> he went down the line. And Earl can tell you, he oh. went down all the way down the line to, uh, to he got to the last guy. That, uh, uh, the guy named was Dave Hobson. Oh, he yeah. looked at Dave Hobson, just looked at him and like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> He, yeah, he went off on everybody. That, that, we yeah. talk every time we get together. We talk about it. He told Dale. He said, "You been he said, it's three years in the league, three teams. Nobody wants you." <laughs> <laughs> you talk Cleveland. Who else? Oh man, you talk, yeah. he came came to the Hornets. You know, he was like yeah. three, years, three different teams. Oh, you would have loved that. If you'd have been in the room with yeah. that. I'm telling you something else. He said, "Didn't you realize you guys are a bunch of guys that nobody wanted?" <laughs> just look around. You're a bunch of guys nobody wanted. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, we're supposed to go out here and play for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's the way to inspire people to, to go out and perform. Uh, I'll tell you, that was one of the hilarious halftime. Inspired us not to never forget that meeting. <laughs> yeah, here we are talking about it. Yeah. yeah. So that was one of the most oh. craziest halftime speeches I've ever heard. <laughs> Well, before we wrap things up, any final thoughts from everybody? I think this is our, our last episode for a little bit, right? We're going to take a little hiatus and then come yeah. back and, and do some more. So we've had a really good first first season, a lot of great guests. Yeah, I got one. What y'all think about the Westbrook situation that's going on with him and with Stephen A. Smith? What happened? I, I, ain't been I, didn't, I didn't hear about that. Well, you know, Westbrook was balling. He had a triple-double. And uh, Stephen A. Smith had made a comment, basically about just basketball, that he wasn't truly impressed about, you know, the West Super Bowl, doubles. doubles, you know. He needed to see more than Russell. Championship level type of things. Felt like he played with a lot of different players, a lot of stars, the Durants, the uh, the Chris, uh, the Hardings and other world, and feel like his triple double just, it just something just to do. And Westbrook responded to it. Yeah, his wife as well. They both kind of took to social media. I was going to pull it up, but basically, Russ, I'm trying to find the exact. Oh, he said, I was a champion once I made it to the NBA. I grew up in the streets. I'm a champion. Basically, like, I'm good. Like, criticize me if you want to. So, and then his wife posted about four Instagram stories and just said, leave us out the conversation. Like, we're good. He's great. He's happy. I think that these reporters, these people on TV, they try to get ahead of the story. They want to have the best story of the day. And they, this is the second time with Steve A. Smith from Westbrook. Steve A. Smith, I know, yeah, ESPN wants you to be the, 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 the main lead, this and that, the guy who knows everything about basketball. Y'all got to, you know, hit the brakes on these guys. You know, these guys, you know, other guys can get on who can't play dead making $40 million. Westbrook, he can triple-double. I mean, it might not be the best for his team, whatever. That's up to the coaching staff. They let him do what he do. A commentator can't change the coaching style. They ain't fired uh, Brooks yet. So I think that some of these guys just over talked about, about basketball, never played the NBA level. They figure like because they got a journalist uh, degree or whatever, they can talk about this and talk about that. You got to be careful out here, man. You know, the man that said, hey, <laughs> he's from the streets. You better take that to heart. Because <laughs> a lot of guys ain't from the street. <laughs> so, but uh, Westbrook, I know. He's from L.A., so C. May Smith might not be going to no playoff games in L.A. this year. So <laughs> that'll be cool. You got to know who you, you got to know who you with. But they said who you with. <laughs> you know. At the same time, though, I mean, Stephen A. gets paid to give that opinion, right? So he's going to give yeah, you a hot take whether you agree or disagree. Hey, Donald so. Trump got paid to be the president too. What everybody think about him? <laughs> Okay, well, I'm just saying, I'm on TV no, over here. We get paid to give opinions sometimes, all right? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm mean, saying you can give opinions, but. No, I, I can't say anything about anybody. I'd be the worst to right. see these you know, so. they, they won't come looking for you. They'll give you a break. Okay. But a guy, some guys, you know, I've seen some guys say some stuff about guys on TV, and then when they get in the same room, they had to run out of their room. Mm. So, yeah, you can cash a check, but can you carry it in your pocket? <laughs> well, that's what I love. I love about you, Oak. You always give them a warning first, though. You know, yeah, no yeah. don't let my name come out your mouth no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That's what it's saying. Hey, we'll see all of that. Oh, I can't wait for Matt, you. 
Next question. <laughs> I'm telling you now. Ten part series. The last and fourth, baby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm a, I'm I, not, my, I, I want my copy done. signed, sealed, and delivered because I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read. I know a lot of the stories, but I want to see it in writing. Yeah. So. Hey, Errol, I wouldn't wait. For this. Hey, this here, you almost <laughs> need two two salt off to to to, to read this book. <laughs> it, it's some it's some shootouts in this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They need the bullet vests all. They need them. Oh yeah, they need the vests. <laughs> hey, ain't no. Is that ESPN? This is the last and fourth. <laughs> Y'all can hide behind the camera. You can't hide behind the force. I'm excited that we have to wait five months for the book. I'm ready for yeah, it. Yeah, we was hoping to be out about to allow. You know, they, you know, they pushed everything back. But right. I can wait. I hope yeah. I can wait. No. Because <laughs> yeah. I've been telling everybody yeah. bits and pieces. They said, don't tell all the stories. So mm -hmm. this is my B work, but you're going to think it's like winning a Grammy. You know, I know some people never win them, but they always had a good work. I'm going to win one. Oh, okay. Boy. We got a part two already. You you said right? Is that what I just? Well, heard you I did a thing? couple. I did a couple podcasts. So this be then I'm gonna follow up after this book with eight. So <laughs> I got to save stories. So I got about thirty for this. And about I got about sixty more. Oh, <laughs> wow. So means like, hey, you might have to wear some headphones if somebody reading it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Are you well, gonna I've voice been, the audio quiet. book that goes with it? Huh? Are you gonna voice the audio? You know, now you have the audio book, or you can read the book. Yeah, it's gotta the, be your um, voice. You gotta voice well, it. I'm, yeah, yeah. So we could definitely, but see, my audio gonna be every story gonna have like five or six people. So I won't have them coming behind talking. How you, you know, when you was there and seeing this happen, what you was thinking, okay. you know, you fear for me or you fear for yourself, and you yeah. know, just tell the story. Uh, yeah. I'm bringing it. Yeah. Ooh. I'm gonna uh. bring Bruno Moore to help me sing it. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Giving the truth. Yeah. Oh, man. Bruno, he bring the team up. Well, yeah. should we wrap things up? I feel like it's going to be yeah, a few yeah, weeks yeah. before we all get back together, but yep. it's been great. Well, I'm, cr now. I'm crushed right now because my Michigan Wolverines got beat last night. That, uh, they, well, they, 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 they had a chance. It's, yeah, it's two teams on the floor, 100 points. I mean, somebody lost by one or two, right? Yeah, they said. Well, 49 and 51? Yeah, they 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 could they missed eight shots in a row down the stretch, and then three in the last seconds of the game. They so they, one or two? Was it one or two? They lost. Oh, one, 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 one. Damn. Lost by one. Yeah. I think they had a chance to win it on the buzzer. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah and, and he missed that. I mean, he missed a wide open three by himself. Yeah, yeah, ball. yeah I, I was. I sit here and just shook my head. I, I wanted to see them in Gonzaga. So I'm a little like Zaga like, hey, gonna be the first team since Indiana to to go undefeated. You know, they, 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 they go with it. I tell you, Bell. I tell, I tell you, about I, Bell. Right now, I, I thought Michigan would, would be the team that match up with them the best because they destroyed their opponents last night. So yeah, they too, they too big for Michigan. Mm -hmm. I told you about Bell. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bell is a sleeper. Yeah. Them boys, them guys, Mitchell and uh, Butler. Mm -hmm. that's the, yeah, that's that's the that's the you know they Crispin and uh, Suggs. Mm -hmm. You know, those two guys, I mean, they're going to be pros, but yep. I think Mitchell and, and Butler can get into them. Right. Subscribe, like, follow us, share all that good stuff. Three League OGs. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple. We're on YouTube. Everywhere. So make sure you're listening. Share with your friends. Tag us. All that good stuff.